Hi, I'm Kate McKinnon. In the Contemporary Geometric Beadwork Project, we've explored a variety of simple and complicated forms. Most things boil down to a few simple shapes. Circles, squares, triangles, or zigged forms, like this star on the table. We figured out how to start most of them very simply, but the zigged form was complex to start because it's got a lot of real estate. That's a folded up line and it's very long. And our starts for it have been to this point cumbersome. So what we did in the tradition of our great exploding sets is we discovered the shape of the donut hole and we've made a new casting model. It's called the podcast bead. This is it. And not only can it take off zigged forms like the star, but miraculously it can start almost anything in the project. First of all, let me explain deconstruction so that you understand what this little podcast is used for and how we get the pieces off of it. Right here, I've got a rickrack bangle half on and half off of a pod. If you looked at it from this side, it looks like just the pod, right? But back here, you can see that half of the rickrack is off of the pod. Zigged things are folded forms, or they can be. And in this case, we could fold the whole thing up, attach to the form, or we could remove it and work with it as a large zig band. People have preferences. Uh, I personally like to work with things in this pod form or flower form because it keeps all the points together and I can easily tell my decreases from my increases. I don't get my thread caught on the bands, but let's have a look at this and see how deconstruction works. You already know that you can use one thread to zip things together. So you might imagine that you could also remove one thread and have things come apart. There are two threads that go through every single peyote round. And the way that deconstruction works is that we cut only one of them. Before I take the rest of this apart, let me show you what I mean on a flat piece so that you can more easily see what's going on. This is the middle of one of our exploding sets. This is an exploding triangle set. And I've already taken two pieces off of it. But as you can see from this little twin over here, I could easily take it down to the starting triangle. It's not so easy to cut smaller casts than six rounds, but you can do it. Uh, it's just not perhaps practical because long wiggly things are difficult to work with. So how do we separate these pieces when they're sewn together? Well, I'll show you. These two are already off, and I'm going to use snipping, one of our scarier methods, to take this apart. This set was built to deconstruct, and so we left marker beads so that we could know where to cut. We are separating these at each new section that begins with white. So I'm going to cut the exposed thread. I know this looks crazy, right, if you haven't seen this before. And to do so, I need pretty small scissors. I've pushed the tips in on either side of that thread between the white beads, and now I'm just going to snip it. Over here, same thing. I'm going to push my scissors in and snip that thread. Push my scissors in and snip the thread. One nice thing about increase stacks is that the threads are completely visible. There's only one showing, but that's just because the other one that installed the round above it is tucked against the cylinder. So this is actually a fairly safe way to cut. Now, I know that it's scary to cut or have a thread come apart in peyote stitch. And in, you might think things would just fail. But in reality, I only cut the thread that installed the round. Well, look at that. Hmm? And that thread is disposable. And the reason there's no little tail on this one is because this is a set that I built to deconstruct. And before I moved on from this round to this round, I finished my thread on this round and wove it in. Then I started a new thread to make this piece. And you can see right here, this is my little tail. Oh, it is true 
that if you haven't reinforced the inside edge of your round, this tail could be problematic if you're rough taking it off or if you have trouble where your step up is, a few beads might fall off of your thread when you take it apart. Big deal. They're right there on your tray. Uh, all you have to do is put them back on when you reinforce the separation round, which if you haven't done it previously, like I did here, you must do before using this piece because Peyote Stitch has two threads running through it and that's why it's sturdy. So what I would do with this piece if I intended to use it is reinforce that center round, pop those beads back on if necessary, and another tactic I might have would be to simply begin building on it. That's perfectly good too. Uh, normally I don't build inward from my pieces, I build outward. Let me show you what these pieces and parts are useful for. We can make plenty of small things with small parts, but we can also start bangles with the larger parts. And right here, these two triangles on the outside of our set turn out to be the key sizing pieces for me. The thing to do, instead of worrying about math if you're teaching a beginner, it's just to teach them to make a triangle or a square, right? This whole set, beat it up, just from this one center triangle, and I do believe that anybody can learn to make a triangle or a warp square, and in that case, if they can make the middle, they can just keep beating to make the whole thing. Now, imagine this is the first thing you ever made in peyote stitch. All you had to do was learn to put three beads together in a circle, and from there, the piece just built. Right? You have taken your set apart, and now let's have some bangle fun. The thing to do is try them on. No. Yes. Hmm. That means that the inside of this triangle is my size, and that also means that the outside of this triangle is my size too. If I wanted to build a bangle, I would use this one, and I would build around the outside edge of it. If I wanted to wear a bangle, I would reinforce the separation edge of this one or put a sizing band in there and build on the outside of it. So this would be something I would build to wear and this would be something I could use to cast off more forms in this size. This is a good example of one of the pieces that I have in progress built around the edge of a triangle like this or reduced from a triangle like this. Here are two rickracks that I cast off of my podcast beads. Uh, this one has 10 beads per side and this one has 11 and it's valuable for me to have each of these casts and try them on. They're both successful in that they both go over my hand and you could see how they could be good bangle starts. But the six point rickrack that has 10 beads per side well, it fits me beautifully at this band size, would need to be larger, progressively larger, if I wanted to build it taller. This is an 11 bead cast that fits me much the same way because it's got more height to it. Now, if you wanted to build a tall bangle, if I did, uh, like this beauty by Pat Verrier, even though they're technically the same diameter here, uh, amusingly, 6 times 11 is the same as 11 times 6. <laughs> same diameter. Uh, wiggling into the longer, taller cylinder oh, takes a little more room. My hand has to be able to deform because the cylinder has less play. So if I wanted to make a bangle that was this tall with 6 points, uh, I would need to add another bead and I would be using 12 points per side. If I wanted to make a very tall bangle uh, that would go all the way over my hand and fit my wrist, I might be talking as many as 13 beads per side. So these are really all the same size. It's just that they may need more real estate if you're going to build them taller versus smaller. So taking casts of different beads per side is extremely useful. If you end up, end up with one that's too small, we can make it into a flower. If you end up with one that's too large, we'll show you lots of nifty fitting techniques to make it work. Or 
that's just your size in a taller cylinder. So, uh, you've seen this one onto the pod. Whether you believe it or not, we're going to show you how to make it happen. I'm using Miyuki Delicas, and uh, these are cylinder beads that are nice and precise. I've got uh, cylinder beads in size 11, and then my circle start are just regular old round beads, seed beads, and a size 8. Um, if you're curious, the Delica colors I'm using are 795 and 1780 are the orange. My white is 351, and currently my uh, blue is 696, which is kind of a beautiful purpley blue. We call velvet underground. So, how does this work? First of all, get 12 beads in a circle because we are making a 12 pointed all wing. Right? 12 pointed all wing. Counting every single increase point, 12. And we're going to start each increase from one of these round beads. So, 12 beads in a circle. Reinforce the circle. I like to cut off my little tails. I don't like tails in my way. And so, I even go so far as to tie a knot so that I can get rid of my tail. And then from here, you're just trying to get to this point where you have your 12 sets of increase beads attached to the ring. This is circular square stitch. Um, if you've never done square stitch, it's really simple. You just come out through any one of these 12 beads in the ring, pick up two increase beads on your needle, and then go right back through the same bead, just like that. It makes a little circle that holds the beads onto the round, holds the cylinders onto the round. And then, because I'd like this to last forever, I'm repeating these stitch. Um, this is the start you get to keep, right? It, it stays with you, not with your piece. To advance to the next bead, just pass through two. Pass through two. Uh, square stitch is a little like uh, square dancing. Little forward, little back. <laughs> funny. These beads are hinged too, which I really like. I mean, they're motile. They can move up and down, which means that they know what they want to be. They're going to sort themselves out for you. <laughs> Look at that. I mean, even from the very start, they're willing to do what you're asking them to do because basically we're coding them to do just that, to be exactly what you've asked them to be. So I'm going to go around this ring until I have all 12 sets of increased beads square stitched on. And this is worth your time. Uh, do a good job. Do it right. This should last you, really, uh, if not forever, for a good many starts. So, do this times 12, right? And you're going to end up with this right here. And then all you need to do is, if you're like me, and you want this to be really, really snug, Go back through the circle one more time and then come out through a different set of increased beads than you finished up on, which is what I did here. And boy, is this a nice start. It's flexible, right? Didn't pull it too tight. And each set of increased beads can freely move on the round, which means that they can self-organize because they have a lot of uh, what a physicist would call degrees of freedom. They can move out of the way. So this right here, from here on out, this is just circular peyote. This is the simplest thing uh, once you've done it, right? You only have to watch out for your step-ups. Make sure you get the same number of beads in each little peyote spot. So herringbone increases. You just come up through the middle of two beads, put two more beads on, and then go out through the other bead. I do take the time when I'm doing herringbone to make certain that my beads are neatly stacked. If you leave them in a mess, like a teenager's bedroom, then, uh, sorry teenagers, then um, you don't really know how much thread you need. Here's your first peyote bead. You just drop it down between the increased beads and you're off and running. So, beads on top of beads. I like to mix matte and shiny uh, beads and you can see that I actually have a few different colors of orange and purple. Uh, I don't care. For me, it's just interest. Interest. So, Keep dropping single peyote beads in between the increase stacks until you have done this 12 times. And then when you get around to the other edge, I'll show you how to step up to the next round. These are concentric stitches, which means that you're not stitching in a spiral. At some point, you are actually going to exit this round and begin another one. 
That's what peyote people call the step up, and it's one way to go wrong. So I'm going to do this 12 more times. Actually, I'm going to do this nine more times, and then we will step up. I've now completed the second round of increases, and it's time for me to slip in the 12th peyote bead. Now, here's where you have to pay attention, and you really actually have to remember what you're doing or know what you're doing. It might be tempting to put my needle up through this first top set of increases here because it's the handiest thing. It's kind of the first thing a person sees. But you need to remember that you're actually finishing the round before. So when you step up in peyote and go from one round to another, you're going to be going through two beads. And if you find that you have not gone through two beads, whoops, then you've probably missed your step up. <laughs> Beating both requires and teaches patience. You've probably missed your step up and you need to have a look at your structure. So there you can see it has made its own space but it might not have been intuitive to find it because things were a little busy down there. However, once you get it in correctly, there's no doubt about it, and you should take a look at your piece at this point. If your port points haven't sorted themselves neatly up and down, help them, sort them out, and just have a look and make sure that everything looks like right with your structure. The orange beads are in between the increases, on each point as they should be and you've got two orange beads at the base of each increase. Uh, if for some reason you've done this part wrong you should just start over because it doesn't take very long to get to this point and this is a casting model so you want it to really be sturdy. So uh, now it's time to start the third round on top of the circle start and it's really just circular peyote at this point. So I'm going to pick up two increase beads, go through the next increases in the round. Now I'm only going through the next round. I'm not going back down into the piece at all. I'm not going to go back through the circle start or uh, back into previous work. I'm only going to be accessing the next, the previous round of bead work. So, and now between the increases, I have room for two peyote beads, right? Two peyote beads. So I'm going to place two peyote stitches on either side of the existing orange peyote stitch. And then I'm going to come up through the top increase bead because that's now the roll I'm working with. That's the round I'm in. So two peyote beads now. See that? It's starting to make a little peyote pattern. And then feel free to hold the work however you like. Turn it, don't turn it. Put it on a pencil. Each time I make an increase, as I said, I take the time to sort the beads out with my fingers or my needle to make sure that they're correctly seated. This will save you a lot of grief later. You won't have to take the work out if you look at it as you're putting it in. So same thing, I'm going to put two peyote beads in this round, one on each side of the increase, one on either side of the first orange bead. I'm using a slightly contrasting orange just so you can really see the difference. Now it's time for another increase stitch. I've come around the circle now and I'm getting close to my step up, right, which is something to look out for and you can see that now each of these previous legs sides has two peyote beads peyotes and orange oh and here we are with three three sides left to do before the step up you can really just count your peyote beads in the side like that to see where you're at um, i think that it's really important to be careful, be mindful about doing this one because it is really easy to get tangled up if you're distracted, interrupted, in a hurry, trying to finish first. Um, you're going to do between, oh, you know, eight 
and 13 rounds on this depending on what you're looking for and we'll talk about sizing later but for now let's pay attention and complete our step up to the next round okay. well, only one more leg after this you can see I live in Boston now. You hear the traffic outside my window? <laughs> Some people used to complain about the bird song in my videos when I lived in Tucson, so now we have city traffic. Okay, so here are my last two peyote beads of the round. Now, my step up is still at the increase, right? So I, I have to take a look and see what's going on same as ever it doesn't matter where it is i'm going to be going up through two beads to finish this round under no circumstance do i want to finish the round by going through the top bead no i took great pains to make this space this ladder and i need to preserve the end of it so if a person who's learning is going to go wrong in this circular peyote stitch it's very frequently going to be here at the step up where they go through only one bead instead of two, end up doing a spiral stitch, and it might be hard to figure out why. So at this point, having completed the step up, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to sort out my top beads, have a feel of my tension. Ooh, very nice, very nice. And then I am going to move my step up to the middle of the round. This is really easy to do. I'm just going to advance my thread advance my thread. I moved through the next three beads without adding anything. There! Now I can pitch my tent here, make my first increase in that round, and that's where my step up will be. I find that easier to watch out for than if it's elsewhere. Now I'm going to start the uh, the next peyote round here right in the middle. So now I have room for one, two, three peyote beads in between the increase. I'm in the middle of the round, so I'll be putting two of them on on this leg and then when I come around to do my step up this will be the last bead I put in and I'll move my needle through these two beads to finish to step up so let's do a few and now once again just going through the one bead increase bead and it's time to put on another increase so now I'm going to do on each of these points an increase followed by three peyote beads. And it, again, pays to remember what you're doing. Every single side gets three peyote beads. And if it didn't, you missed one. And your form won't work. Or I'll just say you'll have a irregular point. Nothing wrong with that. But it's not precise. And if that's what you want, then you have to do each leg exactly the same. So there's a structure we're looking for. One, two, and three peyote beads surrounded by ever rising increase points. Because this is an all wing with increases on every point, the side count will get, will get uh, bigger by one bead after every round. So this just basically goes around the circle Remember your step up. Uh, this is what it will look like when this round is finished. Okay. This is what it will look like when five beads per side. And this one was beaded to 10 beads per side. This one was beaded to 11 beads per side. So you should choose eight, nine, 10, 11, or 12, depending on what size of glove you would order. If it was mail order, you couldn't try them on and you had to choose one of those five sizes. Small, extra small, small, medium, large, or extra large. It really doesn't matter. As we saw before, all casts are useful. Now, I am working with 11 beads per side on this guy right here, and I'm gonna begin a rickrack. Now, 
Rickrack involves decreases, and so to understand how decreases go, I'm using Nymal, by the way, if you're curious about my thread. I'm going to pick up some nice red thread here so that you can better see what I'm doing. So increases and decreases. Hmm. One is intuitive, increases. You throw two beads on. The decrease, not so much. Hmm. Let me needle up here and show you what I'm doing. Now, you can use a stop bead if you want. I tend not to, but let me throw one on here. Show you how it's done. Any old bead. I like a round bead. In fact, let's use a big old bead because it's easy to cut off as well as pull off. So since we're going to cut this one off, let's go. Let's leave a short tail. Tails are just things in your way. Go through your stop bead twice. And then just put your needle into the piece and start building. I like to work in the middle of a side, as I mentioned, because I like my step up to be in the middle of a side. So I will generally start there so I don't have to move there. Now, let's choose one side for increase points and one side for decrease. Doesn't really matter. Whatever you like. I'm going to put my, uh, I'm going to make this the top increases on the white and I'm going to make the darker color the decreases on the bottom. So this first thread, the reason we're not weaving it in is because you know what's going to happen to it. That's right, it's getting cut off and thrown away. So to save people who've never done this before from having to snip into their beadwork, let's do something really nifty and leave a bit of exploding round down at the bottom. You'll see me turn the work in my hand um, just basically to easily expose whatever I'm working on. I don't like getting my thread tangled up. I don't like tails in my way. Um, I like a clear path. If you do get your tail caught, you know, whatever. We're throwing it away later, so it doesn't really matter. So this is the same exact stitch, right? Except Except, when we get to the bottom, we are not putting on increases. Oh no. Okay, let's do... I can actually cut this a little shorter because I've got a double knot in my stop bead and I don't have to weave it in later. Get out of there. So let's see, increases? Hmm. How about... We want something a little bit different so that we can see it. How about let's make our increases orange and our peyote stitch blue. So first round of Rick Rack. Orange increases, blue sides. You should be using a medium tension here because what we're looking for are energetic forms. If forms are very soft, they tend to just lay there and they really don't have as much potential as forms that have energy. Uh, you know, they don't, they can't do as many things. They don't reveal their nature as clearly as an energetic form. Having said that, if you're making a finished piece, soft beading can be so elegant for tailoring. Some of the pieces in the project just drape like silk and fabric of glass. It's, it's really stunning the difference in tailoring you can get just by using a difference in tension. So, oh, here we are down at the bottom of the piece. Now, we have an interesting choice here, but let's make things easy. And instead of adding anything else to the end of the tip, let's do exactly what this is built for and cast off an 11 bead Rick Rack. So that's the last bead. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. The Rick Rack builds upward with a new increase and an abandoned decrease at the bottom of each round. Now, 
This is a wonderful way to set the decrease. This is a casting model, so this is a little different than building a rickrack out of scratch. We're going to leave completely abandoned that round bead down on the bottom. And remember, there won't be any loop of thread after this rickrack comes off because this entire first thread is getting thrown away. Entire first thread. You're not going to go back through this round bead again. Now, just continue beading. At every top white increase point here, I'm going to place an orange increase. At every bottom dark decrease point here, I'm only going to place one round bead. When I come back in the next round, and I'm marching down here with my second round of peyote, I'm going to go through this bead, go through this bead, and pass through them without putting any extra beads on. That's a decrease. So my, my next ad would be here. I will not, in any circumstances, go back through this bead again. So let me finish this round. I'm going to keep adding peyote stitch increases and detonation points for the separation down there. And you can see how easy this is. This is really nice for people. All they have to do is cut off the round beads and the rickrack just separates. There's no need for snipping. Uh, it's really a dream. So uh, I'm going to go around this and I'll be right back with you. When you're ready to put on the last bead of this round, it's the same step up that we discussed before. You're going to be going through two beads. This one finishes the round, right? And this one steps up to the next round. You can do it in two if you want to. And did you see what just happened there with my thread? How it got twisted? Gotta watch out for that. If it doesn't look right, it isn't right, so go back and fix it. So this is what you should look like when your first round of rickrack. It really just looks like more all wing, except with single big round beads at the tip, right? Well, when we get down to this point, we're going to do the decreases. Stick with me here as we begin the second round. I'm going to do the second round in blue again as well, so I'm going to end up with a blue line to start my rickrack. Blue line. And uh, this is just straight peyote stitch, circular peyote with increases. Throwing in the decreases makes for a different form, the rickrack. Again, I think it's important to sort out those increased speeds when you have a chance to so that you don't accidentally find out that you had extra thread up there the whole time. If they're a little bit twisted, you could end up with loose increased speeds, and that really takes away from your tension. Now, having said that, if you're a very tight beater, I'm sure you could devise strategies <laughs> like that to leave a little bit of room in each round can go back and take out the twist at the end of the round so that your beads loosen up. We're using medium tension in all of this work. Uh, we want things to be springy, not loose, but we don't want them to be super tight either. Because tight things are no fun to play with. And these things are extremely enjoyable. Okay, see we're coming back down on the decrease now and it's easy to see that we are because it looks very different. The top just looks like increasing peyote, right? And you're gonna wanna put increases on the top of those stacks because when you get up there, that's what they're gonna ask for. But on the bottom, you're gonna rapidly see that things are different and you, you will be much less likely to automatically try to put an increase in the wrong place. So 
This is the last bead of the round, and you can confirm that by counting if you have any curiosity about this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So having confirmed this is the last bead of the round, we're now going to start our official decrease by passing through the two bottom beads of the last round without adding anything. Just thread. Right there. See that? Just thread. Boom. And then when you begin moving up the other side, these beads will draw together at the point. Later, after this work has at least six rounds on it, we're going to come back and just cut this bead off, which will render all of the first installation threads only two inches long, and it'll be easy to peel these tips off and wiggle the rickrack free. So you're never going to go through those round beads again. That was it. They're like stock beads that you cut off. They're like hitching posts that you use to wrap your starting thread around so you can identify it later without having to put your scalpel into the beadwork. Although, as you saw, cutting the increased threads is actually no big deal, uh, especially if you have, um, you know, tension because the threads are exposed in the corners and they're easy to cut. So that's really all there is to it. In the next round, when you're coming down here, you're going to be placing a bead here, here, here. But here, you're going to turn around, put your needle through that bead, and back through that bead to continue decreasing. Each time you come to the end of the round, you'll be bringing the last two beads together. Now, an interesting way to think about this is to think about teaching it teaching it. How do we teach someone to do this easily? Well, I have a little idea about this, and in the book we're teaching this by having our people complete the deconstruction of the set. I have these tied together here. Oh, and this is actually a really good example. If you get into a situation where you've accidentally cut the thread in another round, well, you know what? It's not that big a deal. Like I said, worst case scenario, a few beads fall out, and then you go back and you fix them when you reinforce the separation round, which you must do anyway. So the fact that I lost three white beads excising a section is no big deal. <laughs> Unless I didn't have another white bead to replace it, right? There we go. Two white beads, gone. And this section of the triangle now is available for decreasing. So this is actually how I like to teach the decrease when uh, I'm teaching new beaters. So let me needle up, get around in here, and I'll show you what I mean. Now, interesting kind of deconstruction here where you've actually just hacked down into something, right? I've just got a little tail sticking out of this thread. I don't leave long tails. I know most people do, but I don't. I don't like them. What I'm doing instead is I am pre-weaving in my thread. Right? If you weave it in as you're putting it in, you never have to cut it off. And I am actually, this looks crazy, doesn't it? Pulling my tail down inside the beads. And then I'm changing direction. Put my needle through these beads here. So I don't actually make a big deal about new threads, changing threads. Instead, I pre-weave in my tails so that they basically don't even exist. Now, if you don't know what you're doing next, that might not be a very clever thing to do. If you may wish to deconstruct the piece later, or you are doing something questionable and you need to know where your tails are, by all means leave them. But if you know what you're doing and you know that you're just going to weave that tail in later and cut it off, why not weave it in when you start? Look, done. So anyway, I'm going to put on the beads that fell off, plus the other two that I took off to expose their working thread. And there's one. two, three, and a fourth. We'll catch up with the beads that fell off and were removed. And 
You can see the previous working thread there in a pale orange. It's going to be irrelevant in just a few minutes, so I'm not even going to worry about it. I'm not going to weave it in. I'm not going to do anything, because what I'm going to do now is go back and pick up the past couple of beads that that thread was protecting. So this is weaving in that tail, because now that little this little tail of orange thread is redundant, right? So people make very heavy weather about changing threads, but honestly, as long as you understand your structure, that's the important thing. Now, let's look at the decrease. This is the easiest way to do a decrease is to fill in a space. So I'm gonna fill in with blue, right? And when I'm done, this triangle is going to have a new center, and it'll be just intuitive decreases. Sometimes filling in is a successful sizing technique as well. Okay, we're coming to the corner. This goes really quickly. Now, I'm at the end of the side, and so to complete the decrease, I'm going to pass through the two corner beads, right? Because they're not there. And then I'm going to continue adding beads in the center. So this is a kind of a decrease that is intuitive. You simply ignore the corner beads. You're not going to keep adding because you're getting smaller. So I'm going to come down here, pass through these two beads, baby stitch, pass through these two beads, and in the next round when I'm coming along, my last bead will be here, and then I'll pass through the two new blue beads I just added without adding any more. Having said that, if you want to change a, from a flat form to a dimensional form in only one round you can do crazy things like change decreases to increases so just so you know you have options here you now know how to do the flat decreases right and the rickrack decreases well what if you wanted to change this to an increasing structure you wouldn't think that a flat triangle would be a good candidate for that but in fact everything is possible so if you were going along and instead of doing your decrease in that space you put in an increase well you'd be making a geometric puff with no tube okay. so right here if i want to immediately begin growing another triangle on top of this one I can put two increase beads. Instead of passing through those decrease beads, I can put two increase beads on top. And then from here, you can see in the next round, if I keep putting increase beads on top, I'll get another triangle right on top of the other one. We have a pattern called a tri-wing ring that has two triangles stacked, but it does have a bit of tube between them. In our case, the tube is made from an emra band. Uh, so you can see that at these corners, at every corner or point, you have a lot of possibilities. If you did want to make tube, triangular peyote tube, say if you wanted to start a geometric rope like a power puff from volume one off of this piece, you could absolutely do that. Right now, I'm starting a peyote tube by putting one bead at the corner here. And if I just repeat this pattern of two beads, one beads, two beads, one beads, I'll make a tall rope, and that can be then increased for a puff. So, as you can see, nearly anything can be started from anything else. And one of the things I've really learned doing all of these casting models is that I think I could make a universe from a single point or a line, and certainly if I had a form like this, there's nothing I can't start off with it. So for now, uh, please go ahead and make yourself a pod 
and when you finish the number of rounds that you think are going to be useful for you, go ahead and take a thread pass through the outside edge so that it doesn't become disrupted by your casting efforts. That way we can take a few different things off of it and it will remain sturdy. Um, that's all there is to it. And if you have questions, please be free to leave them in comments on the book blog. It's contemporarygeometricbeadwork.com. Thank you. Have fun!